So I actually will take you um, on a journey through time and space, 2,400 years back, when there was a smart man, a very wise man, Plato. He was asked by the senators of the state um, on advice on the future. And so um, he said, his, his advice was quite simple. He said, if you want to predict the future, you first have to understand the past. And so this is an advice that even might help Greece today. But we are not talking about the financial situation of the world. We are talking about our future, the future of social games. And so what can we learn about the future of social games when we are looking at our past? What have been the major milestones? What have, what have been the major disruptions? What have been uh, the ways user behavior changed, the ways it uses access games, it uses play games, and also developers, how they actually get users to play their games and how they monetize. And there has been a lot of change, but there also have been constants. Social games have been around for a very long time. And so uh, even more than 2,400 years ago, uh, games was a very social, um, a very social thing. People were sitting together, they were playing games, they were having fun with their friends, sitting at the table. And even Plato, he was a uh, passionate gamer. He liked card games and dice games in particular. And interestingly enough, nothing much has changed for more than 2,000 years in the way social games have been played. It was, uh, was very, very similar. Um, until 1958, when a very fundamental disruption came. And this was the rise of electronic games. So in 1958, um, that, that game was invented by a man with a very funny name, um, William Higginbotham, who actually worked at the U.S. military. So many inventions have been done on, and have been driven by the military, for instance, the wheel, the computer, the internet, and now we know also games. So at that time, um, the, the, during the Cold War, the U.S. military used their supercomputers to play war simulations, and Will um, thought, yeah, maybe I can do something else with it, and so he took an oscilloscope home, wired some telephone parts to it, and he invented this game, which looks more like a shooting game, but it was not. It was actually a true casual game, just people playing against each other. Uh, tennis was a two-player, multiplayer uh, social game. And uh, it, it spread very virally through the military community, so it, it got a lot of attention. But unfortunately, there were the, the number of supercomputers at that time was very limited. There were maybe <coughs> as well. But it took another... 15 years now before we had the next major change. And this was actually in the 70s when the arcade games were invented, I think by Atari, who also became the driving force of the arcade industry. And at that time, it was pretty much uh, TV screens, some electronic parts uh, soldered to it, and then connected to a coin operated box which allowed to monetize these games. And these were already very social gatherings. So if you're talking about social games, as you can see there, people were standing, they were playing together, you pretty much brought your own social network to the arcade, and, and the social games were played <coughs> on the spot there. The next major interruption that we saw was actually home computing. So uh, now, as, as technology progressed, people were able to play games at their home, as comfortable at their home, and this is actually a real historical document. The guy on the right side, this small guy, is our co-founder and creative director, Michael Karkowski, playing the version of Bruce Lee on the old Commodore C64. So he discovered very early that he wanted to be in the games industry. So now let's become a little bit more scientific. So what we have done, we have done some research and we really tried to identify the major milestones and also plotted them against the revenue that was generated during that time by the industry. And what you can see here, that in the 1970s, 1980s, this was the golden age, the first golden age of internet gaming. It was all arcade, arcade games. And uh, the age of the arcade, Pac-Man being one of the big games at that time. Um, if we look what, what this game generated in today's money, it was around $3.5 billion, just this one game. And the entire industry during its peak actually generated uh, as much, if we would take today's money, as much as $18 billion. And this was at that time more than the music industry and the movie industry generated combined. So it was a really big time for games. And what happens if you have an interesting industry and a lot of growth, lots of companies go there. So what happened, we got a smaller, a lot of startups founded, we got big corporates going in. The quality of games actually decreased because they were supposed to be produced more efficiently. Everything was pushed out the market. And that led to a crisis, and in the end, 
revenue dramatically uh, decreased down to 10%, so it decreased by 90%. And then, out of this, the slowly the next waves developed. So the next uh, step was home computing, as we have already said. And this was uh, led by Nintendo, who actually developed games like uh, Super Mario or Donkey Kong, or another Japanese company, Taido, invented Space Invaders, which was also a very uh, big game on, on the home computer, um, published by Atari. And this was also, as we know, a social game. What we also had at this time was a split up of the industry. So we pretty much had two areas. One was more the hardcore console games, which feature, which focused more on deeper gameplay, also sometimes brutal. And uh, then there was the casual games industry, which we mined flat. And the hardcore games industry, up to now, still contributes a major part. But as we see later on, social games and casual games pick up. The next big change was the internet industry. And here, uh, the major uh, disruption was really that we could play now international. And I still remember sitting there uh, playing Yahoo games on the Yahoo portal and uh, playing pool, which was the big, their biggest game. And I would play against a guy from the US, and later on I would play against somebody from China and then against somebody from France. So it was already very international, and we, uh, I think this still holds true today. Uh, we have a panel right after this about the international distribution of uh, games and the international aspects. And that pretty much kicked off with the internet. But what is really interesting and what we all hear about is the, uh, the rise of the social networks. So we see with the social networks we really had a big pickup of the entire industry, especially on the casual side. So we had now social networks coming up with Facebook. And uh, this all led into the next phase of mobile games, which is where we are today now. So today, we really see another boost through cross-platform reach. So the question is really, uh, to understand this big phenomenon, how it is exploding right now, what are the major drivers? And so I have talked to several industry experts, and we all agree that, okay, that there are actually three major drivers, uh, three major boosters to the industry. And one is the social graph, the second one is the freemium business model, and the third one is accessibility, that, that our games become more accessible. And um, the social graph, I actually saw a very eye-opening video on that. Who here has seen the presentation of Mark Zuckerberg? In the, uh, you can actually see the IPO presentation in the internet. Anybody? Okay. It's actually, um, I, I got quite inspired by it. And the point that he made there is that he said, okay, Facebook is a really important site. But Facebook will move out of, of the confinement of the website. Facebook is more like a, like a fabric that is wrapped around any other website that is out there in the world. And I think Julian from Facebook will talk about that more tomorrow. But uh, this picture, I think, is quite impressive. It shows the social connections across the world and where, how different people are using Facebook in different geographies. And uh, he made the point that you can take any website and wrap the social graph around it, and then it's like switching on a light bulb. And that definitely has also happened with social games. So here's an example of the social graph powers social games. You can see, here's a level map on the left side. You see your friends there. You see how they are progressing, where they are standing at which level. When you pass a friend, you, you visualize it. You, uh, it gets more exciting. And you can also give some love. You can send uh, nice presents. You can send gift lives. So um, social graph really enhances games. And this is what we all benefit from today. But what is interesting, different kinds of gameplay actually are uh, diff uh, benefit to a different extent from the social graph. And so let's look at some of these game, uh, game genres. So we see here um, a matrix where we have shown are games more niche or are they more mainstream? And at the same time, is it more a solo gameplay or is it more a gameplay that will benefit from the social graph? And interestingly enough, the resource and simulation games, which were the first wave of, of social game genres that, that really became very popular on Facebook, they probably became so popular mainly due to, to the, uh, we call it now, spamming opportunities of Facebook, so really the viral distribution opportunities that were open there, and that they were very mainstream. But in terms of social graph, they are not the, the most social games, because uh, yes, it is interesting, but it is not too interesting to see all the different powers and the different farms that, that my friends have built up. So uh, they benefit from the social graph, but not, not entirely. And similarly, it's with the, uh, the big 
hype coming now, the mid-core games, which have tremendous user values if you compare that. So our resource and simulation games have about five cents per DAU, and uh, mid-core games have actually up to 80 cents, so really high ARPU, but at the same time, similar to hardcore games, a much more limited audience, and also not such a need to play in the social park. So you can also play them alone, and the user experience is also a lot driven by the ego of the player themselves. And then we have another genre coming up, and there's also a talk, I think, uh, during this conference about wagering in social games, which is casino games. Nowadays, 16% of all the top Facebook games are casino games, so it's a really important genre. But if you're honest, I mean, they monetize quite well as well, 10 cents, so better than resource and simulation games. But if you're honest, uh, like a slot game is not really social, so you're pulling the thing, but what your neighbor is doing, even in real life, people don't really care. So it's more a solitary game, exceptions being your poker and bingo, which are of course more social games. Mm -hmm. And then there is another genre coming up right now, uh, which is now uh, quite popular on Facebook, and that's arcade games. And so what is interesting, um, we are pretty much back to square one. So history teaches us <laughs> arcade games are actually the ones where social gaming has started with. And they have lower lifetime values at the moment, so three cents is kind of an industry benchmark. Um, but uh, they are, have a very high replayability. Uh, they have lower arcs, but they have higher lifetime values because people stick with them longer. And so, um, if you really look how arcade games developed over the recent three years, you see that they consistently gain more and more share of the total uh, Facebook uh, game ecosystem. So in 2009, there has been none. In 2010, Visual Blitz has been the first one which really became popular. 2011, already 20% of the top 25 were uh, arcade games, and then in 2012, 50% of the top 10 games are actually arcade games. So that is kind of the genre of the day, and probably one big trend that we have there. If we go back to history, we see that these kind of games have a very long history. So one example is now the, the bubble games, there are lots out there right now. Uh, it was originally developed by a table, it was called, it was called Bubble Bobble. And now you have several ones of these, like our own game, Game Girl, Bubble Speed, or Bubble Island, Bubble Witch Saga, and now Zynga's newest game, Bubble Safari. And similarly, also very popular arcade game genre, the, the Match 3 games. And surprisingly, 1978, Atari developed the first electronic Match 3 game. And now we have also several on Facebook. So Bejeweled Blitz, the first arcade game that became really successful, Jungle Jewels, our Game Girl version, and then uh, Candy Crush, and Minus Minus, and other games are out there. And uh, the interesting thing about Match 3 games is they have a very, very long history. So it's said that even Isaac Newton analyzed the different combinations that are possible with uh, Match 3 games, but of course he still did that on paper. So what is so interesting about the arcade games and why are they coming up right now? Um, there is really a difference in lifetime value, as we have shown before. And here we see on the left side, we see uh, how Zynga actually behaves with, with hit games, where you have a hit and then the reach declines. And on the right side, you see uh, arcade games, which is our games portfolio at Game Goal. And the time frame is the same time frame, it's two years. And you see our games don't have this hit characteristic, but they are much more constant, and that allows us to realize higher lifetime values. And that is really the interesting part of arcade games. So this, the next big driver was freemium. So what does freemium mean? We all know it. It means getting users on for free, teasing them, and then trying to extract money later. And also here we can learn from history. And the first thing, it was not really freemium. So in the arcades, they had this coin-operated model. So you would pretty much throw a coin, you could play a game, and uh, you had people that became really passionate, and they threw like 100 coins a day into these machines, which, which is kind of what a hardcore user would, or more, more engaged user would spend a day. And so it wasn't really freemium, but one characteristic of this model was that it really allowed a nice price differentiation. So somebody could try, a casual gamer could try for, 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 for very little money, what, how it works, and somebody that's really passionate would spend much more money. And that was a quite, a quite good characteristic of, of this model. And it was very popular. In fact, uh, Tato, when they uh, built their Space Invaders game for arcades, it uh, caused a nationwide shortage of 100 yen coins in Japan because the game was so popular and the machines were powered with 100 yen, 100 yen coins. Um, then came, came the next step, the home distribution, and this worked actually 
via uh, boxes. So the this business model was actually not as um, not not as good in terms of differentiating between the users. So for for a casual user, thirty dollars for a game was quite a lot. For for a really passionate or hardcore user or somebody that is much more involved, they were ready to pay much more. They were ready to pay thousands of dollars so they could buy all these boxes and would never be able to play them. And so. Uh, in one way, the, the, the weight of the distribution shifted more to boxes being put in the shelf and being advertised, and on the other hand, uh, it generated one big problem, because many people thought that these games are too expensive, so you got a lot of viral distribution at that time, but that was not necessarily something that was wanted. So people were copying these games, sharing them with friends, something that we like today. Actually, at that time, people didn't like it at all, and it was punished by law. And so uh, that's why it moved on and we had some time when the internet came, we had a new business model which didn't really help against the piracy issue, but at least resolve, it resolved the problem that people were uh, putting out boxes, making nice advertising, then you bought it and you were kind of disgruntled. So and then with the free, uh, free trial, the try before you buy model, people would first test the game and if they really liked it they would buy it, which led to an increase in quality, so it was a good move for the game industry in general. But uh, what really changed the industry and one the big boost or the big premium booster that came is actually the virtual goods model. So when you look at the IPO prospect from Zynga, you will find that Zynga is making 95% of their revenues from virtual goods and only 5% from advertising. So it is by far the dominating revenue model right now. And what I find interesting, uh, how it's distributed between the different kinds of virtual goods. So, 30% um, are only consumables, booths, energy, lives, and 65% are durables, decorations, permanent booths, which I find quite interesting, but it is exactly that point that whales are ready to pay a lot. And so a whale would pay probably a permanent booth, which, which is outrageously, outrageously expensive, but because they are really passionate, it's worth it for them. And um, these whales, actually, the, the users that generate most of the money, these are only 3% of the entire audience and they generate 80% of the revenue. And that's one important part um, of the industry and really understanding what drives our industry. And what is interesting is also looking at their demographic at the moment. So 40, well, almost half of them are older than 49 years in the US and it's also much more female, 70% female, only 30% uh, male. And what really did differentiate the companies now and what we have seen is that uh, actually reach and monetization are not necessarily the same and it is really important to focus on these whales to, to make it big. And if you look, you can also get this data from, from, from this uh, Zynga IPO. Uh, it's very interesting to see how far will decl decline in terms, of, in terms of DAU, but in 2010, even though DAU were declining sharply, still the monetization moved up the bookings. Bookings are kind of a um, measure they use for revenue. So, you, so what they actually did, they said, we don't care if we have all these uh, players on there that don't want to pay anyway, let's focus on the whales, let's focus on the ones that really are ready to spend money, and let's move revenues up this way. And that's uh, very important to understand, and that also requires um, different ways of how we develop games nowadays. So let's again look back in history. How were the games developed in the past? So there were guys standing in the test lab and we were inviting users and everybody was playing and this is how we try to determine whether we have the right game. That's very different now. So this was like this for 30 years and just with the advent of social games with technology improving and uh, with, with the model of games as a service, we changed very much to analytics. So now we don't have to invite users, we can actually see what they do. We don't have to ask them what they like. We can show them and if they like it, they will use it. And that makes a big difference and that also allows us um, to follow these rails around. And um, another big change or another big driver, which, which is not really free, which is actually purely free, is the, the comeback of advertising. We also have a panel about that later. And you can see um, that there are still imbalances. On the left side, you see the global advertising market. And you see that uh, in the US it's about $600 billion nowadays and how it's distributed. So the major share is still TV, TV, print, direct mail and other offline. But only a small share is actually mobile and online on the left side. And on the right graph we have compared that um, in terms of um, ad spending compared to time spent. And you see TV and, and radio is kind of balanced. 
web is moving up still less spending compared to time spent, but almost there. Print still very strong in balance, surprisingly. And mobile, you see this big opportunity there with the uh, red arrow. So there's almost no advertising money spent at the moment. And there's a big opportunity because there's so much time spent. And so um, what I would predict is that over the next years, actually this share of 5%, which we have now on average in terms of advertising revenue, will strongly increase and maybe end up at 10 to 15% because we have these general imbalances in the industry and the advertisers uh, still have the chance to embrace mobile marketing much more and that will lead to higher monetization. In terms of the freemium model, another big driver is actually frictionless payment. And the most obvious, uh, it is visible in the mobile space, where we see that, for instance, the monetization of Apple is about five times higher than the monetization on Android devices. And the reason for this is pretty much the frictionless payment that Apple offers. We know Android is working on it, we have many improvements uh, there, so we, we all see that this will get better, but we know about the importance of frictionless payment, really allowing people to pay at the moment when they have the desire to get something. Now we come to the third booster, which is accessibility. And so an old friend of mine said once, um, well, there's an old business saying even, that says, if, if your customers don't come to you, you have to bring your business to your customers. And this is what accessible is all about. So with the mobile devices, we actually bring our games directly into the customer's pockets, and that's a big driver. And if we look how this has developed over time, we see that with each step that the industry moved, the accessibility has increased. So we see it. First, it was only arcades confined to a, to a space, and it got already bigger. People would have in their home, much, much easier accessible. Then with the internet, much easier play worldwide. And then with social networks, pretty much, when you're with your friends, just play a game at the same time, just the, the mental friction much reduced. And now we are in the face of any time, anywhere. And we see that this is very successful because even uh, of the 900 million Facebook users, 500 million are already on mobile devices. So half of your social users are playing on mobile devices, and if you reach in there, um, it's one step less for them to actually spend time and, and also money with you. If we're going back, uh, one big driver of this entire growth was also the open APIs versus portals. So here you see how different platforms, how many games were there on different platforms. And so I still remember the early days during the internet, the big, the big players were Yahoo, AOL games, and you had to know the games manager really well, you had to build a good relationship, you had to make sure you pay your price to be in the store. And there were maybe a uh, hundred to a thousand games on these kind of platforms. And then AOL, uh, Facebook actually said, um, let's open up the, the, the API, let's, that users can just connect and publish their games. And this increased the number of games already dramatically to three, more than 3,000 now. So there are a lot of games on Facebook and th the major driver for this was probably the open API. And then you see in the mobile space it's even more dramatic. So there we also have an open API. We know it's not always that easy to deliver games because they, they still look at the games um, before they put them online. But still, uh, there are no restrictions in terms of pay, paying a placement fee that uh, negotiate a long time. It's very easy to get your games on there. And we have now uh, hundreds of thousands, thousands of apps on, on, of games, especially on Android and iOS. Which brings us now to really the point uh, that who wants to reach the gamers actually has to understand the distribution. And so, um, what are the next big steps in distribution? And there we see now a war of the app stores coming up. So, we see that um, the old iOS app store, pretty much iTunes, the beginner of the game. Then we have Google coming in as the leader of search. Then we have Amazon as a leader in user recommendation and uh, understanding user behavior. And then we have Microsoft, still small, but not to be underestimated, latecomer. And now even Facebook joining the fray with their announcement of opening up the App Store and, uh, on, on Facebook. And so it is possible that there are a lot of opportunities out there for, for us that understand what is going on there. And uh, that might be another disruption in terms of distribution where there's new opportunities for us. And if we look at Facebook directly, we also see kind of a move of, uh, and then shifts of user acquisition. So the first viral phase uh, in the early time was ad-based revenues and pretty much taking, uh, taking advantage of the viral uh, channels that Facebook offered in a very open manner. 
And then later on, it got a little bit more organized. We went into the area of paid distribution, which was very good because it increased quality, it decreased spam. But unfortunately, that also had only a limited lifetime for the regular developer because at some time the customer acquisition costs uh, developed to a level that it is very difficult just to build a business on paid acquisition. And so now it comes to a consolidation and uh, now the big ad networks actually and, and the big the publishers had an advantage because they could channel users from one ad to the other and that was a much more profitable distribution than, um, than paid distribution. And moreover, you could focus on whales and channel them to the right apps and also look at niche apps. So this phase is almost over now because now the next phase comes with mobile, which is the cross-platform distribution. So it's not only between apps on one platform, but it's also between apps on mobile and social. And there are, I think, two panels also in this conference about cross-platform and mobile, what is the future of mobile social. Um, that's the area where we're in right now and where there's still a lot of development. And one example for cross-platform is also um, Zynga, who has decided to go off Facebook with their uh, Zynga.com platform, where they pretty much say, we can take better care of our whales on our own platform, we can control the environment better. And one of the reasons why they do this is because they found out that this cross-platform distribution is more successful. And one example also is one of their games where they implemented that very well. Uh, which is Words with Friends. So you can play the game on Facebook, you can play it on your mobile device, you can play it on Zynga.com, and while you're playing it, you're syncing your scores, you can even uh, stop at one platform, uh, pick up on the other one, you have all your social graphs with you, all your friends. And what is really important, what is happening, yeah, you, you get these kind of um, notifications on your mobile phone, for instance, if you have installed the game. And that's a very powerful measure as well, so these kind of push notifications. And that's one part of, uh, of a channel that right now is maybe a short-term opportunity and that has helped uh, this kind of game to grow like, uh, very dramatically. Unfortunately, Zynga doesn't publish too much of their metrics about the cross-platform distribution. But uh, we at GameDuel, we have been doing this for two years now, and so I will share some of our learnings there. So right now we have already 45% of our users playing on a cross-platform context, which is very much in line with what Facebook has in terms of uh, distribution between the platforms. And what we see that these users that are cross-platform are more valuable and have higher retention than the users that are not. So usually they generate 14% more revenue than users that are just on one platform, and also their retention increases by 25%. So it's definitely worth taking the extra effort for us and the reasons behind that are quite clear. There are several cross-platform boosters, so you can play 24-7, anywhere, anytime. You have more brand exposure. Um, you have more friend interactions because you have, uh, for instance, on the web, you, you play with the social graph, but then uh, on the mobile you might show to a friend and this friend downloads the app and then later on reconnects via the web. So you have a lot more uh, interactions going there. You have more CRM touch points. You can send newsletters, you can send messages cross-platform and you can also um, send, send push notifications as we have seen it. So cross-promotion also gets a totally different meaning between the platforms and you can take special care of your whales really putting them to the platform where you feel they are ready to spend their money. And so this is how I would see the future now. Um, we are connected across time and space. We have the brands cross-platform, we have the social graph on all platforms, we have the game graphs, all the game data, the, the high scores. Um, you have the virtual economy, so money you have spent on one platform, you can use it in the other one. And you also have special marketing channels, um, with, uh, where, where it would go that far that, for instance, you play a game on Facebook and then you get a message if you want this special boost, you first have to install the mobile app. So you can, we will see a lot more of that. So we have talked a lot about the future now. Let's go back to all Greece. So, um, at that time, probably life was much more simple. But on the other hand, we have much more opportunities nowadays. And so the question is, what will be the next genre? What app store will win the race? Uh, what will be the next big platform? So, how do we really deal with this in our industry? And maybe there's something we can learn from Plato as well. Because he said, um, he had a, an approach to business as well to life, which, which works in all cases, which is, um, if you, which, which makes, if, uh, you, you will be the most flexible, you will be the most successful, and you will even have the most fun of it. And so what he was saying is actually, let's approach life in a very playful manner, 
let's enjoy what we're doing. And we are one of the, uh, we are this fantastic industry which is growing a lot and there are a lot of opportunities and let's just live life as a game. <coughs> Hey, we have a question on Twitter for you, if you don't mind. Um, okay. We'll go to the audience. Uh, somebody was saying, you know, you're talking about the future. Yes. Uh, so, Facebook went public, you know, Zanga went public, Yelp went public. What's next? If you look into your crystal ball, what's what's coming up with social gaming? Who's going to go public next? What's I think happening? I think before more people go public, the ones that are public still have a lot to do to to change the the <laughs> <universe. laughs> So that would be my personal guess, but I'm I'm not a stock analyst, so. So I'm more a games guy, so I'm, 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 I play this whole game and see what ha what's happening. Cool. Is there anybody in the audience that has a question that wants to ask them? I, I have a question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my name is Johan Holstrom for Speed Games. Uh, I'm question, you, you talked about the importance of grades in the uh, farm and type of games. Uh, you know, counting for 80% of revenue. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think, see that whole truth? Uh, also for the arcade type of games, or is that more of a... It's a little bit better distributed, so it's not as tough as, as uh, social games, like 3% generating 80%, uh, so it's more like a classical 80-20 rule. But still, as we have seen already in the arcade past, yes, definitely it's like this. You have players that were ready to push the coins into these machines like crazy. And then you have players that just want to sample and maybe play a game a day. A game a day. But I think that it's easier to get some money also from the non trails in arcade games. A little bit easier, but not really. Peter um, Vivante Center, Belgium. Um, you talked about the rise of arcade games, mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, there's the whales who generate a lot of the revenue. Mm -hmm. um, we also see in the pricing model, uh, in the uh, payment. In, uh, uh, model is that it's difficult to go below like 90 cents or say, 80 cents because then the cost becomes too high, yes. which is partly solved with virtual currencies where you buy anyway for five dollars. Do you see there a place for real like slot like type of transactions where you could like do like 50 cents, 25 cents every time and, and try to get people uh, monetized that way? I mean, at the moment, what I see is still that you have the wallets, and that's what Facebook tried to do with their with their Facebook credits. So I think that's the closest we have to frictionless payment, and also on on, on, I, on Apple, where you pretty much can easily pay these small amounts. Let's see what's happening. Uh, who else will also be there for the web and uh, on social games? So you have this, you have these interactions already out there. Um, so, so I would say that's that's part of the game already. Hi, Damon Marshall with Supersonic Ads. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that whales are three percent. You could probably say that uh, paying customers only make up to maybe five to seven percent of an audience. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering um, how you feel about the future of advertising and um, monetizing the non-paying users, which account for. Yeah, so I, I showed it more from the industry top-down perspective. So I see a lot of future there. And we see it already now. I mean, we, we are working together. You know that, that we do a lot of uh, ad placements in our games on Facebook. And uh, we see that right now it is more an inventory shortage than, at least for us, than a, than a shortage of ways to place the ads. So I think that the industry will catch up and we will not have an inventory shortage anymore at some time. And uh, definitely there's a big future for these kind of uh, monetization tools. I mean, that's part of the ad model that, that we have totally novel ways of integrating that into the game that we had in the past. So it's not anymore just a display ad. It's much more powerful if we integrate it properly into the gameplay. Oscar Clark here from Fire. Um, earlier on, you talked about sort of the social games versus the sort of, well, how social games are. Yeah. I wonder if we need a different language because there's a difference between the way that we play a Farmville game, which is an asynchronous, non pressure, or like a Facebook poke type social experience, mm -hmm. which is very different in terms of its um, enjoyment level mm -hmm. and something which is an intense, real time play experience. Right. If, with that in mind, would you have drawn your graph differently? You know, your, your, your four points, because my uh, gut feeling is that actually we're underestimating the value of that low pressure social experience because mm -hmm. it's allowing such a much wider audience 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, we can we can go uh, into discussions here. So it's definitely definitely open to discussion. But um, pretty much, it's about the intensity that the social graph can add to the experience. And so, exactly as you said, the, the games that have a very broad mass market reach and uh, allow this kind of casual uh, social graph integration are very successful simply due to the reach. But the game itself will not benefit as strongly from the social integration. So other games will benefit even stronger if they integrate closer with the social graph because it's more intense. Than I disagree. Modern. I think it's absolutely a different type of experience and one which can create new types of gameplay which don't create depressions, which would turn on the players off. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what you're talking about, is that one has maybe a smaller reach than the other. Because if you're saying it generates pressures that turns people off, it's, it's maybe a smaller reach. Part of it, yes. But I agree. I mean, there are many ways to define it. And uh, as I said, let's take it as a play. We can define our industry the way we like. It's important that we find models that help us to be successful. Cool. Any more questions? That's a good sign. You got to lose some questions. <laughs> Give them a big round of applause. All right.